Welcome to Rogers TV's COVID-19 local update for March 27, 2020. Over the next half hour, we will bring you updates on the pandemic in the area. I'm Anandi Carol Woolery. Tim Philp spoke with us about how the Rosewood Home and Emergency Shelter have been handling the situation. Well, there are a lot of things going on here, Patty. The uh, uh, Rosewood, one of the first things is we're, we're actually closed to, uh, to any visitors here. Um, we've implemented uh, a very stringent cleaning regime. Uh, several times an hour, uh, all of the doorknobs and surfaces are wiped, out, wiped off with uh, sanitizing uh, solution. Um, anybody that comes into the facility is uh, required to... Uh, uh, like our residents, they're all required to use sanitizer on their hands, and we're trying to get everybody to practice uh, the uh, uh, social distancing to avoid any spread. And so far, so far things have been pretty good. There've been no signs of uh, of, of anybody being sick here, and uh, we hope to keep it that way. Well, we're we're doing pretty much the same thing down at the uh, the winter warmth shelter. Um, we have a, a lot more people there. We have. Uh, you know, we've had uh, in the high 40s uh, up to 50 people staying there. I mean, you know, you'd think as the weather got a little bit warmer, a little bit nicer, that it would start to drop off. It's not. Um, the shelter is full, and it's uh, um, looking after a lot of people. Our, our biggest problem down there has been feeding people because the when the shelter was initially set up, it was set up that uh, the food would be provided by all of the uh, social agencies around town that provide uh, meals every day. But because a lot of those programs are run by older people who are, you know, at the most risk of, uh, of this illness, uh, a lot of those programs have shut down. There's still a couple running, but a lot of them have shut down. So now we're supplying food uh, directly from Rosewood House there every day, and uh, the Salvation Army is supplying uh, bagged lunches for us. So there's a lot of there's a lot of cooperation between agencies here in town, and I think I think that's something uh, uh, something that needs to be noted. You know, we're we're all kind of in this together. Um, Ten minutes before uh, this interview, I was on a conference call that had. Uh, all of the uh, emergent, all of the shelters here in town, Nova Vida, Salvation Army, ourselves, uh, Penn Marvian, Kaori Manor, all of the people that look after uh, large groups of people, and, and the city were on that call as well. And uh, the level of cooperation and uh, um, just working together has been great. Um, I'm I'm actually expecting one of the one of the one of those agencies to stop by my door. We're we're giving them uh, five liters of sanitizer, you know, because they're running short, and we have uh, we have enough to be able to do that. So we're all working together. We're all working very hard to make sure that uh, that we keep this disease away. Now, if we get it, and you know, I mean, the mayor has you know been saying that you know this crisis is not over yet, and we have to keep vigilant. And if we do get it. There are uh, steps in place that uh, we're going to be taking. We're able to isolate people here within the shelters. Um, people who are uh, who are at risk, you know, older people, people who are immunocompromised, people who uh, uh, may have chronic conditions or lung conditions like COPD. Those people are at far, far greater risk of this illness. And the city has uh, made arrangements for them to to stay elsewhere and isolate themselves. Uh, so that they won't uh, uh, they won't be at risk of uh, of catching this, or at least as much as is possible. Well, I think the best thing that the community can do is first thing to do: go wash your hands right now. Go wash your hands. That will that will that will help a lot. Second of all, practice social distancing. Do not come by the shelters. We 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 don't need people moving around. The best thing that people can do right now is to stay away. And, and let us work uh, with the people that we've got and try to keep them as as isolated and safe as possible. We've got uh, the resources that we need to to feed people, to keep people uh, where they are, and to uh, make sure that they receive uh, proper medical care should they get sick. So the best thing that the community can do is, uh, like I said, go wash your hands. Our very own Danielle Deshaw speaks with Leanne DeVoe about how to address your employees during this pandemic. Welcome to this special segment, all about 
focusing on how to adjust how you work in response to COVID-19. Joining me today talking about engaging as leaders and companies in a very different context and environment is Leanne DeVoe. She's a senior HR consultant with Low Alley of the Hamilton Burlington area. Thank you, Leanne, for being here today. Thank you for having me. So we, you know, we had you on the C-suite about a month ago, and we were talking about employee engagement, really from an attraction and retention perspective. Fast forward a month, and now it's a very different environment. How is engagement different from, you know, a month ago to where we are today? Well, obviously engagement is different because we don't know if people are getting laid off. The economy has completely fallen. Um, you've got employees who potentially are sick, employees who are traveled who are now quarantined, and now those other employees who are working are picking up the slack for the ones that are quarantined. Um, so it's just everywhere right now. So everything is definitely has changed within a month. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And so what are some challenges right now that companies and leaders might be experiencing just trying to even just rally and, or keep motivation up with their team members? Well, I think right now, one of the biggest things is people don't know if they're getting laid off. They don't know if they're getting laid off. They don't know if they're going to have a job to go back to because it all depends on how the economy is. It depends on like, depending on if it's a small business, how long are we going to end up being quarantined for or self isolating for? Is that going to matter? Is the, are those companies going to be able to, you know, be okay from this and start again? It depends on how long everything is going to be. And I think that that's the biggest thing that employers and employees just don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that the biggest thing for employers is they need to be transparent and communicate. Okay. So communication, very key then, because we're shifting from engagement from, yeah. you know, you know, kind of those, sometimes those really good kind of benefits to almost be more focused on security and safety, you know, safety and security, you know, with your job. And if you're still working, that safety and security was in the workplace too. For sure. So no matter what is going on, you need to be transparent with your employers. If you don't know if you're going to be laid off in a couple of weeks, let them know that. Say, I'm not sure if, you know, if that's, going to be a possibility or if you know that they are going to be laid off let them know be transparent and if you know that you want to bring them back and that's the goal and and let them know let them know what the plan is you have to let them know you have to be transparent and keep and if they are laid off keep communicating with them especially the guys that are in the trades because you know what if they don't know what's happening there's a good chance that they can go find something else and you, we all know trades people are very hard to find mm -hmm. absolutely so do you have any kind of tips for when companies or lead and leaders are communicating to, to their teams and their employees, some maybe percent, potentially some do's and some don'ts? Um, right now, I would say email to employees, um, a lot of construction workers or a lot of uh, places that are um, like, for example, I know that there's certain manufacturing companies where their managers know their staff's like, text messages or cell phone numbers, give them a call, say, Hey, how's it going? You know, this is the plan for the week in this time. I don't think it really matters if you are calling or emailing, you just have to be transparent with them. So whatever the best way of communicating is with your employees, do it. Okay. And what about if you have many different layers within your company, different departments, how can companies ensure that everyone is getting the same information at the same time and there's consistency in what's being said? So the CEO, the president, they need to be directing that. So they need to set that communication and have their staff break, like their managers, let their staff know. So if it is an email from the president or CEO, that's probably the best thing. Send that email to your staff, to your staff. If it is, if you, the only way of communicating is through a cell phone, read them the email, T send them a picture of that email, like through text, like there's ways just, I think that it's best that it comes from the head and trickles down, but with that email, everything is directed, send that email to your staff. Having the CEOs draft up an email just to staff that needs to go out. Okay, and we only have a few. So all the communication is the same. Okay, perfect, thank you. And we only have a few minutes left. Yeah. So any cautions that you can give when, when, you know, when we are communicating to our teams and to the company as well? Uh, I would say don't let fear into that communication or email. Don't show them that you're worried about the business. Just be transparent, but don't, don't let that fear show if there is fear. 
I think that's the biggest thing because everyone's already so worried and so stressed out and, you know, not knowing what's going to happen. You don't want your president or your manager to show that. So I think that that's the biggest thing is be professional about it and be transparent, but just don't show the fear. Fear. Okay. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today and providing all of these ideas and tips and tools to help companies and leaders to communicate in this, in this very different time where engagement is critical uh, and very well needed. So thank you for being here today. Thank you and uh, stay safe. <laughs> Stratford Mayor Dan Matheson announced that the City of Stratford is declaring a state of emergency in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak. Good morning. A short while ago on the advice of the City of Stratford's Emergency Control Group, I as Mayor declared a state of emergency in the City of Stratford. I did so in an effort to raise awareness with regard to community spread and the dangers it poses I also did it to raise awareness about COVID-19 and coronavirus so that we can all do our part and to make sure that we follow the advice of Dr. Miriam Claussen and the professionals at the Huron Perth Public Health Unit. And we have to do it in support as well of our frontline healthcare workers, our EMS workers, those clerks in grocery stores and pharmacies, the truck drivers who are delivering our food and everyone ensuring that we receive our essential services. I ask you if you're looking for medical information about the virus to please visit the Huron Perth Public Health Unit at hpph.ca. For information on the City of Stratford and the programs and services we are providing, please check out stratford.ca. Now more than ever, we need to be vigilant. We need to do our part. We need to follow the advice of our healthcare professionals and collectively and together, we can help stop the spread of this dangerous and deadly virus. Almost every municipality in and around the Grand River region have declared states of emergency. These are the municipalities that have declared states of emergency as of Friday, March 27th. The region of Waterloo, including the cities of Kitchener, Cambridge and Waterloo, and the townships of Wilmot, Woolwich, North Dumfries and Wellesley, the city of Guelph, Wellington County, including the towns of Erin and Minto, and the townships of Puslinch, Centre Wellington, Guelph Aramosa, Wellington North and Mapleton, the City of Stratford, Perth County including the municipalities of North Perth and West Perth, and the townships of Perth East and Perth South, the City of Brantford and the County of Brant. As of March 26th, Guelph Mayor Cam Guthrie declared a state of emergency for the city. We spoke with the mayor about the declaration. Well, it uh, really came down to a couple of issues uh, that were made aware to me yesterday. Um, as you can imagine, things are changing on an hour to hour basis. And whenever anybody hears a politician or a leader say that um, from the provincial or the federal or even the um, municipal government, uh, they, they need to know that that's the absolute truth. Things are changing very quickly uh, every hour. And so based on the information I received from the medical officer of health along with other uh, medical officials yesterday, um, especially in regards to an outbreak that occurred at the Gulf General Hospital in a specific ward, uh, I, I decided that, uh, that that was one uh, sort of trigger that I wanted to use to make sure that I mentioned that. And then the other part of it was I was just very disappointed over the last little while to um, hear from some people uh, that I, I both know and I don't know uh, that are not taking the what I'm calling the, the rules of engagement seriously, which is the uh, physical distancing and also people that are returning from uh, out of country or overseas. Uh, not taking self-isolation seriously either. So for those reasons kind of all combined, I thought it was really important to send that message uh, out to the community that um, we're taking it seriously. Uh, and now it's it really is your turn, citizens and businesses. You need to take this seriously as well. Yeah, so it's interesting because, 
you know, all, when, I think when people hear state of emergency, they, and it's natural, I mean, even myself, uh, if I didn't know sort of the nuances to it, it's natural to immediately think, oh, everything is shut down now. Um, you know, and it's not actually the authority that's given to a mayor. Uh, there, there has no authority for that. Uh, what it does is it, um, the, uh, the actions and directions that the emergency response group, the, of course, the uh, medical health officer uh, and others are going to continue doing the, the work that they've been doing over the last week and a half, almost two weeks now, uh, taking actions, taking steps uh, for the health and safety of the community. By declaring an emergency, it does give me the option of other actions and directions that I think I could take uh, to protect the health and well-being of the community. Uh, but uh, I'm not actually doing that. I'm not, I have nothing, you know, nothing up my sleeve here <laughs> at all to try to do that. Um, it's really about sending a message uh, to the community about the seriousness of the issue. Uh, and it also um, does allow, if we get to a certain point, which, you know, I pray that we don't, uh, that they would be, people would be covered under uh, insurance, uh, WSIB, things like that, if a call out had to go out for volunteers to help. Uh, so no, by all means, you know, go go out, go outside for a walk and, and, and go for a hike or go for a bike ride. I mean, of course, it's it, those things are important. It's about taking the rules, though, while you're doing those actions. That is so vital. It's keeping the distances and not grouping together. And and those were some of the disappointing stories that I was hearing the last couple of days. Uh, people, like as an example, we closed our playground structures a few days ago. And then I'm seeing and hearing from people that are taking their kids to the playground, and uh, and we closed it a few days ago. What are you doing? Like, no, no one should not know these rules now. And uh, so th those are the, some of the things that I, I hope that really is a good takeaway from people that we're taking it very seriously. And now it's time for everyone else. I I said to somebody earlier that um, you know for a passing grade, uh, you know, 51% is not good enough. We must have a hundred percent participation uh, to get over uh, to really get over this issue and to battle the, the virus as best as we possibly can. And so I'm hoping that my statement of the declaration really drives that point home. Well, I, I don't want this to become a uh, you know everyone's tattletaling on each other because that can overload are already critical systems that are trying to focus on other things right now. And so I, I don't want people, you know, always picking up the phone or emailing the agencies that would be responsible for that. And really, right now, there's there's two. One would be our public health system, the public health units across Ontario. There's all the different ones. Uh, and so you could always reach out to them to request some information there. Uh, and also our police uh, are looking at stores that are breaking the uh, emergency declaration from the province in regards to the essential business lists, uh, whether they are or are not essential. And uh, so our police are uh, taking a more of an educated uh, approach uh, to get into compliance, uh, but they do have powers to uh, summon people to court as well. Um, further to that, our public health unit also has inspectors. And so if the public health officer feels that things are not uh, being adhered to, then they can uh, be sent out to again try to get people into compliance. Do we do we do we want all those resources going to all those things? No, just follow the rules, and then we're not wasting our resources doing that. They can be doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. And again, that comes back to why I declared the emergency, which is to drive the point home to play by the rules. The biggest one that I know I'm receiving as the mayor, but I know my mayoral colleagues across the province are, are getting the same question. They're being inundated by it. And uh, and I don't blame the citizens. They, they don't know where to sort of turn. And the mayor, as the figurehead of the spokesperson for the city, is always sort of that, that point that people go to. But it's really important that under the act, when you declare an emergency for your city, the mayor does, does not have any authority to close down any private businesses or services. None. 
zero. <laughs> so it is very important that 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 structure, those decisions, the essential lists, all comes from the province. The mayor has no authority to do that. And I think a little bit civics 101 right there is important, again, so that people are directing their questions and their concerns to the right order of government. Uh, and so uh, we're here as the spokesperson to support our agencies and the frontline workers um, and to make decisions if need be. Uh, but really, we are uh, making, trying to make sure mayors that uh, people go to the right place so they can get the right information. Brant County's Health Unit's Acting Medical Officer of Health released an announcement on the situation in the area. We've received questions about COVID-19 testing. To date, there have been 309 tests administered in Brant. These tests have confirmed three cases of COVID-19 we've announced previously. While these numbers remain important, we know they do not tell the whole story of the seriousness of the pandemic. That is why it's so critical for people to stay home if they are ill. Public health recommendations and the orders handed down by the provincial government reflect the graveness of the situation affecting us all. I'd also like to reassure all residents that test or no test, anyone reported to the health unit is followed up with and is being regularly contacted by the health unit. If we find during any of the check-in that symptoms are worsening, we advise the individual to seek further medical care at the hospital. To date, we have fielded over 2,200 calls and emails from concerned residents. Because there is no treatment a hospital can provide with someone with a mild COVID-19 illness, staying at home and self-isolating for 14 days following the symptoms starting and making sure any fever is gone and the symptoms are improving is still the best action anyone can take to avoid spreading COVID-19. We need the support of everyone in our community to overcome this. This means following our key recommendations like physical distancing and self-isolation for 14 days after travel outside of Canada. We are all in this together and only together can we meet this. The region of Waterloo held a press conference this morning on the current situation in the area. Here are the details. So as of 10 a.m. this morning, we have 69 cases in Waterloo Region. Of these 69, 33 are confirmed positive and 36 are presumptive. Of that total, 11 cases are currently in hospital. The total number we have tested in Waterloo Region is 1,463. Of that number, 901 have been confirmed negative. We are awaiting test results on 493, and public health is monitoring 562 cases. And one case is now resolved. With these increasing numbers, I want to remind residents that we should all take precautions and assume that we could encounter COVID-19 across our region. I talked about a resolve case, and I want to provide an update about when we consider someone resolved. So the Ministry of Health has provided updated guidance on that, when someone can be considered resolved. For individuals self-isolating at home, Provided that the individual no longer has a fever and symptoms are improving, they can stop self-isolating 14 days following the beginning of their symptoms. This applies to individuals whether they were confirmed by testing as well as individuals who were not tested but who have symptoms compatible with COVID-19 and whom we've asked to self-isolate at home. So it's 14 days from the beginning of their symptoms, provided they are improving and no longer have fever. For hospitalized patients and healthcare workers, there will still need to be two negative tests 
at least 24 hours apart for them to be considered resolved. Now I'll go on to uh, a request I have for faith communities, churches, and um, other uh, gatherings. On March the 17th, in order to slow the spread of COVID-19, I requested the closure of all church and other faith settings, among multiple other settings. Many faith communities and churches in Waterloo Region have suspended physical gatherings. I sincerely appreciate their collaboration. For those faith communities and churches who are still allowing large gatherings, even if they do not technically surpass the 50-person threshold as set out in the provincial order, I urge you to please suspend all in-person gatherings. Please explore virtual options to continue supporting members of your community. I know that all faith communities and churches want to help their members and they are doing everything that they can, so thank you. For all groups, it doesn't matter what type of gathering that you're thinking of organizing for all organizers of those gatherings, for all persons of those gatherings. Given the community transmission of COVID that is now occurring in, in our region and the regions and the area municipalities declarations of a state of emergency earlier this week, it is more important now than ever that we do what we can to encourage and enable our residents to stay home when they do not need to be out. Rogers TV will have COVID-19 updates as they come out. Stay tuned to Channel 20 to stay informed about the situation in the area. This coming Wednesday, Rogers TV presents the RTV Quiz, hosted by our very own Giovanni Fatetti. The RTV Quiz will air on every Rogers TV station in Ontario. Tune in to Channel 20 for your COVID local update at 7 and the RTV Quiz at 7.30. For more information, visit rogerstv.com. Thanks for watching. is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command.